I got this call from my wife saying, I've, I've just seen this tweet, you must look at this right away. And David Cameron tweeted a photograph of himself holding a telephone to his ear and looking serious. The brilliant Rob Delaney, he'd seen this and what he tweeted was a photograph of him with a tube of toothpaste in his hand instead of a telephone. So I looked around and there was a tube of wet wipes. So I put, I put this to my ear and put on a very serious face with the, the same little remarks that, that Rob Delaney had made. Well, it exploded. It was an hour later before I looked and saw the myriad, the multitude of photographs that other people had tweeted. I mean, one guy was holding a dog. Somebody else had a baby in their hands, naked little baby. Um, there were bread rolls, there were bananas. It, it was all very funny. I think there is a hunger for this kind of in the moment excitement. And people today are excited by that, by the immediacy of it. It connects them to events. It connects them to people instantly. For a long time, stories, it was an, an oral tradition. Somebody would take a story, then they would embellish it, they would go on, they would talk to other people, and going way back, those things were shared around campfires, and then kind of moving forward, they found other mediums. Post-war, we had the advent of television, where we suddenly became receivers. And it kind of got further and further away from that ability to embellish what a story was, you know, become more and more a broadcast medium. We often think that that's the, the norm of storytelling, but actually the norm is really what's being liberated through technology today, liberated through the lights of Twitter, liberated through social. Humans want to be a part of shaping the narrative that is driving society, and these channels are giving them that opportunity. We have to lose that, that idea that we are more creative than consumers. We have to respect that they're equals now with, with us, and we're working with them. One of my favorite quotes is from Rashad Tavakawala, and he, he says that we're set up like classical orchestras but this is the age of jazz. When I think about live storytelling, that's the perfect metaphor. You know, yes, there's a general structure that we want to sketch out, but it's up to us to riff off of each other, improvise, and tell a story that's shaped and formed based on the talent in the room. This notion of live storytelling in this age is really about how do you begin to bring a ton of voices into telling a single or sometimes divergent narrative? How do you design a story that's not fully told? something where you need people to fill in the blanks for you and make it richer and living. I think the traditional way of defining a story where there's a definite beginning and end, nowadays, live storytelling is an ongoing process. We think of it in terms of shape-shifting content uh, based on audience engagement, based on what we're hearing, based on what feels like it's working. Live storytelling is, is being present and offering content that feels present and fresh. The audience is inside of it. They contribute to it. It doesn't have a neat beginning, middle, and end. It actually changes and shapes itself based on reaction. And it doesn't end when you say it's over. It ends when the conversation is no longer relevant. So the origins of this uh, live storytelling movement, you know, I think you can actually see in politics. I will start by explaining why I came forward to tell my story about my affair with Governor Bill Clinton. I was a volunteer in New Hampshire on the Bill Clinton campaign, and you may recall the Jennifer Flowers eruption. So the campaign was in a position where they had to respond quickly and effectively to a potentially very damaging story. So we walked through the streets handing out The Man from Hope, which was this VHS tape, hopefully convincing people that Bill Clinton was someone they could trust. And what they learned in Little Rock, Arkansas, was that you had to hit back at your opponent within the same news cycle. And that was rapid response, which meant you had three or four or five hours until the five o'clock news to get your message and your counter message in front of the media. This is President Obama's 2015 budget. It spends too much, borrows too much, and taxes too much. 
Fast forward now 20, 25 years, the technology has shifted dramatically. It's still critical to have a compelling story and to deliver it in a timely fashion to the right people, but now that's happening online and it's happening through different platforms. We welcome President Barack Obama and Governor Mitt Romney. The 2012 presidential debates were a watershed moment with politics and Twitter. You could not watch that debate without being on Twitter. If you were, you were missing out on half of the conversation. Campaigns now use Twitter as a real-time spin room. They are responding in the moment to breaking news, to the actions of their opponents, the attacks of their opponents. And so we, we took a concerted effort to go out and find women who had backgrounds that could be qualified to become members of our cabinet. I went to a number of women's groups and said, can you help us find folks? And they brought us whole binders full of, uh, of women. Mitt Romney talks about binders full of women. The Democratic Party is, is offering up promoted tweets against that and inviting you to, to donate. That's brilliant. When Mitt Romney went after Big Bird. I'm, I'm going to stop the subsidy to PBS. I'm going to stop other things. I like PBS. I love Big Bird. I actually like you, too. PBS served up a tweet inviting people to donate. That had real business impact for them. Guess what? They, they, they saw record donations the next day because people wanted to support Big Bird. Those kinds of moments that unfold on the platform and provide color um, and commentary on the act, political activity as it unfolds are absolutely the future of, of politics. Those are here to stay, and people who don't embrace them uh, will be left behind. Politicians have taken to Twitter in a remarkable fashion. 100% of the United States Senate are active on Twitter, 97% of the House. They have embraced the platform in a way that other industries were a little bit slower to. There is a long tradition of Madison Avenue learning from political campaigns. I believe you would not have the Oreo tweet if you hadn't had the Big Bird tweet just a few months earlier. The Super Bowl blackout last night helped Oreo brand shine brightly. The tweet heard around the world. Everybody asked me the same question, like, you know, how could you have prepared? The key with that is that we were prepared with a model to be agile. And everybody always asks me, how did you know and how were you ready for the Super Bowl? I said, well, for the last 100 days before that, we were putting out a piece of content that was culturally relevant every single day. So we were building the muscle memory, the process, the internal alignment around what was necessary to operate in real time. So when it came to the Super Bowl, we were able to turn around that tweet, which said you can still dunk in the dark, within four minutes, four minutes from the time the lights went out to the time we put up the tweet. And it's all because we had built the muscle memory over the last 100 days to know how to operate at that speed. Right now we're sitting in our real-time social command center. What we've tried to create for Verizon is the voice of your sort of tech-savvy friend. So just like a real person would be watching the Super Bowl right now, we're watching the Super Bowl. And we're looking for ways that the brand can respond in an authentic way and be part of conversation. The way we wanted to operate for Super Bowl is to allow our conversations to reach consumers more directly. We partnered with the Empire State Building to create a light show. It was the first ever social media driven light show on the Empire State Building. Our fans are driving the ability of that building to either light up with the Seahawks or the Broncos colors. So what we're doing at the moment is engaging fans in real time with customized content that we're creating on the fly. The social media team is listening for cues and then they're crafting a strategy on the spot of how to uh, identify a cue that's worth talking about. We're calling it a trigger. And then once we have that trigger, we're then briefing a creative team in. They're having a quick round table. They're coming back to the head of social strategy and myself. And we're talking about, is this something that seems to be going in the right direction? If so, we make a creative implementation of that. And then we're reviewing it with our client. And then if everything goes smoothly, we're posting it out to our audience. There's something really provocative about the idea that you can connect to somebody in the moment when it's most relevant to them. And I think things like Twitter, where events are unfolding, conversations are in play, people are, are expressing what they feel right now, has provided this new opportunity for brands to get that much closer to someone at the point of impact. This year, we launched Axe Peace. 
had the opportunity to create um, a very different type of campaign for the Axe brand. But we've got one room, the love room, is really the command center of how we're managing all of our social feeds, everything happening on the internet. We invited people to snap a selfie of their kiss for peace. People got it immediately that they were gonna go hashtag kiss for peace and upload their kiss. Then basically we took all those pictures, put them up in Times Square. We snapped a shot of it and we tweeted it right back to them. People then took those pictures and then fired them out. So we not only had tens of thousands of pictures come in, but then that turned into millions of impressions. So our approach to bringing Make Love, Not War to life was very much about taking the conversation and actually turning it over in a way that we hadn't done in the past. We also had a room dedicated just to creativity. They were free to do whatever they want and then bring those ideas over to the love room where we decide, okay, are we gonna go live with this or not? Most of what happens during the game, you know what the likelihood is. There will be a winner, there will be a loser. And I think planning out a broad range of content is critical. But there's also those moments of the unexpected. Working through plays like a team is actually the heart of, of how we approach um, preparing for something like the Super Bowl. The best brands who are operating in real time are the brands who are planning ahead for it. You know, we're seeing brands get better and better at this. You know, they're starting to, to figure out the patterns. We know that people are going to talk about getting ready for an event, for dinner, these sort of expressions of, of actions. And so planning for those predictable conversations, they're more efficient for a brand to, to participate in some ways. And because the bar is lower, it's not the Super Bowl, it's Tuesday. Zquil noticed that people were aligning around this hashtag. Their everyday live storytelling opportunity is to serve up a tweet against that hashtag, against that conversation that people are having, and do it on tone in a way that sort of shows that we're with you. Now, we, what we're seeing is people can step into the story. You know, we're, we're seeing um, people respond to brands and brands take that content and, and actually do something with it in the, in the moment. And whether you're a brand or a celebrity or a consumer or a merchant, um, sort of all those stories and all those conversations are coming together in a way that makes it so much bigger and so much more interesting and so much more engaging. We launched American Express Tweet to Buy, which basically enabled people to tweet a special hashtag and to buy a product on Twitter. During Fashion Week in the fall, we partnered with Rebecca Minkoff. What we did during her live fashion show was that we pushed out a tweet that told our card members that they could buy this beautiful Rebecca Minkoff bag just by tweeting a special hashtag. It was commerce on the Twitter platform in a way that had never been done before. Our card members loved it, and they engaged, and they shared, retweeted with their friends to show that they had just made this incredible purchase. So it's so much more than a transaction. It is a conversation, and it's something that you're doing personally, but something that you're doing with friends, and that you're doing with Amex. You know, we're talking to the people who are making these purchases, and we're asking them to send photos of what they just got, and um, you know, it's all a conversation. What's happening on Twitter is not random conversation. It's conversations about cultural topics that matter at that moment. And if you can figure out how to tap into that and have a real point of view, a point of view that's so unique to you, but at the same time provocative, and adds to the conversation, then you can have explosive engagements. The ability to connect from conversation to experience in such a seamless way will transform how we deliver consumer experiences. What was amazing about Trending Vending was we wanted you to actually be able to taste culture through the eyes of an Oreo. Affectionately, we called it Eat the Tweet. And the whole idea was, how do we take what's trending in Twitter and actually turn that into a physical product, a physical Oreo that you could actually taste. We created an algorithm in partnership with Twitter, which decided based on conversation volume or sentiment of a specific trend, what the flavor combination and pattern combination would be. And so the machine analyzed and then printed out a trend based on what was actually being discussed on Twitter.
Just imagine what a future of this looks like. You're watching the Super Bowl, you see an amazing Oreo Super Bowl ad. Then you have a great conversation on Twitter about that Super Bowl ad, and then you can literally go to the store and buy a cookie that represents that entire experience that you had. I mean, that's some profound kind of next level kind of stuff. I think that the technology is enabling us to create cultural events that we just, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to, to do in the past. The opportunity on Twitter for, for all of us, I think, you know, we're just at the, the very beginning of it. And so we see a lot of innovation, um, not just from, from brands, but, um, you know, I, I look at the media industry, for example and you look at how um, they source stories and how they tell stories today, and it's, it's completely different. Quiet, please. All right, it's 8.16, time for what is trending today. How about this for a new study that could shake up research into marriage over the last 40 years, okay? A lot of couples talking about this this morning. You still have people very focused on creating good television, and I don't think that's changed. Today we're using that as a competitive advantage and using our scale of a television show viewed by millions every morning and making sure that we're extending that across platforms. We have social media producers who are constantly updating platforms like Twitter and Facebook. And then you have Carson Daly himself, who's kind of the face of making it digestible to a mainstream audience. Every story we tell now, in some way, the audience influences. We're in the orange room right now, and this is a perfect example of something where we're telling stories specifically the way people want to interact with it on different platforms. And social platforms have allowed us to really see where the passion points are. A good example is we recently had Love Your Selfie Week. One day we were asking people to just share their selfie and tell us how old they were, and this really great conversation started popping up around cancer survivors, and it just became this community thing where people were cheering them on and showing support. So that's a good example of a story that we definitely found another part of the conversation we weren't necessarily expecting. Publishing a story used to kind of be an end point. In many ways, publishing a story today is really the beginning of a conversation that uh, you know just continues to, to be fluid and, and happen every day for 24 hours a day. We very recently ran what we'd like to call a live documentary entitled Forgotten Serious Children of War. It's a 48-hour experience, and uh, we ran that on all of our platforms uh, today. The Breakfast Show. You asked Mother when she noticed that the baby was being paralyzed? About, uh, 10 days ago. 10 days ago. Yeah and then sort of stepping stone from the broadcast in the morning to a exclusive webcast that we did midday. Then we'll throw again to the uh, peak time bulletin and nightly news. And then back to the web. And all through that, we'll be running a continuous stream of coverage uh, on the website and, and through social media. The, the kind of social media dimension just gives us so much more of a tighter connection with our audience and actually enables us to, in an agile sense, to iterate our coverage as we go and make minor optimizations as we move. The notion that a new story has a beginning, middle, and end, and then it's over has always been something of a fiction. The fact is that just because an article is done or a television news package is done doesn't mean that the story ends there. Twitter allows news organizations to continue the dialogue, to get feedback, which feeds into and creates a richer experience around a new story over time. Literally, you have hundreds of millions of people who are sometimes consuming the news, sometimes talking to each other about what they're seeing, sometimes acting as essentially repeater stations, rebroadcasting on behalf of the news organizations. And once in a while, one of those users is actually going to say something, and by tweeting it, they are providing a feed into the news gathering organizations around the world. The hundreds of millions of people on the ground are going to produce content, some of which will be great, some of which will be wrong, right? I heard these names on the police scanner, they might not even hear them correctly, and there will be a lot of noise, even though there's a lot of signal in there, there will be a lot of noise around the edges. The role of journalism is to really synthesize, curate, and analyze all of that rich data as it pours in and provide a perspective and a synthesized perspective on that event as it unfolds. So you can look at information that's coming through, whether it's on Twitter or Vine or, or, or any, uh, any source, but 
Is it been vetted? Is there one, two, three independent sources? So while it may change the immediacy of what we do in the news business, it still doesn't change our, our core mission. We're in a time where everyone and every single individual is their own media company. Practically everyone can be a content creator today. And so that alone is just surfacing up all kinds of new creativity that may not have been visible and exposed before. The participation element is influencing the story writing from the start. Say, I am happy. I am happy. <laughs> so am I. So am I. We are happy. We are happy. What do we do now, now that we're happy? So Ian McKellen and myself, yeah. we found ourselves cast side by side so there were all the conventional ways that, that people would know we're on Broadway, but we decided, you know, that there's something that we might do. If we could find a way of telling a story about the two of us as friends being tourists in New York City. We were tweeting one, sometimes two photographs a week, all the way through the life of the play, 22 weeks. We had no idea what impact this would have. It became known as the bromance. People were saying, hey, who knew? Th this guy is funny. The story of who Patrick Stewart is and as a performer, what, what his range is like has begun to change. What has always been so uh, thrilling for me, being a stage actor, is that there are live people sitting out there. If you're sitting in an audience, you are helping to make that one performance that night unlike any other there will ever be in. You are a participant in the event. Then that's happened with social media and with Twitter in particular. There's nothing more fun than everybody being focused on one thing in that moment and then Twitter becomes this sort of you know, the, the lightning rod of that, and you're seeing everybody's reactions to whatever's happening in real time. Back in 2008, I remember, you know, just how obsessed I would get by seeing my tweets get, you know, favorited and retweeted, and, and it, it was something that just kind of stuck in my mind, and it was like, oh, is there a way to actually create a real game out of that with actual stakes and points? At midnight to show, the toast by Chris Hardwick. Welcome at midnight. I'm Chris Hardwick. And he has three comedian guests, and it's sort of a faux game show uh, where he takes them through the day's social media, and he awards points based on their ability to craft the best joke. Hashtag war. So a couple posted a bunch of their wedding save the dates, which they made to look like they're starring in a romantic comedy, and immediately flew to the top of Reddit. Tonight's hashtag is ruin a rom-com. Kate. When Harry killed Sally. People are naturally kind of live tweeting about what they're watching, or you know, uh, you know, talking to their friends about what they're watching, and. You know, I think At Midnight just takes that behavior and puts it in a really specific context. We take content from the web that we see bubble up in social media, everything, you know, Twitter, Tumblr, Snapchat, Vine, wherever we find it, and we put it into a game context. We see comedians interacting with it, and they put something else back out there that then the audience can take and iterate on themselves. Dan Levy. Another high school friend had a baby, and now I hate them in 3D. Television has traditionally just been a one-sided conversation. It's really just kind of been uh, a monologue. <laughs> <laughs> and then you sort of absorb it, and then the web allowed people to say, oh, well, now we're gonna talk back and help shape the thing together as a community. The most important thing, in my opinion, about social media is that you have to remember that it is social and not just all about you. If we were a tribe of 100 people, you, you would have to give back to the community to make it grow. You couldn't just eat all the food and then be like, why, how come I'm not getting more food? in my, my, my mouth hole. It's not about advertising you, it's about community building. And that's 
a lot of times about other people. <laughs> it's a, an amazing opportunity we have now with the tools um, that are available to us to listen to what the audience wants immediately. An idea like Summer Break is the same thing as Karate Kid. You know, it's high school romances. It's like, what does it feel like to be a teenager that's not comfortable in their own body? But how do you tell that story now for today's audience that wants to reach out and touch what they're doing? We casted kids that were creators, that would create the show with us. Summer Break had a great Instagram account where the kids would post all their pictures and they would have an open dialogue with their fans. The same thing on Twitter. Twitter kind of served as their stream of consciousness, a stream of consciousness for the show. YouTube was the video home. It wasn't just a one platform experience. And that really became one of the home runs of Summer Break. Every piece of content was very platform specific. The story here for AT&T and for us was the innovation. The fact that we were all trying something together. As storytellers, usually we make a story, we put it out there, we see how it does and that's it. But this, when you think of it living and breathing, we use data to inform story. So we would see which characters were gaining the most followers, which characters were getting the most engagement, what was the conversation around the story online, and we could tell from that what was working and what was really resonating with the audience. And then as producers, we can decide where to move that story. You just have to like test and listen and iterate and test and listen and iterate. Every piece of content we develop, generate, create, acquire, has to have a digital plan. And within that digital plan, social is an essential component. With The Office in our initial season order, we only had six episodes. During the summer months, the networks used to be in all repeats, basically. Six episodes repeated over three months was going to piss off an audience very quickly. So I thought we needed to get some original material out there. We were the first show to do webisodes. All of that kind of decision making helped make that show more successful. And that's what we're trying to do now with Twitter and, and with our social partners around the shows that we put on air today. Because we get that instant feedback night after night from our audience, we see the ways in which they interact with the content that we're putting out there. You know, what are they embracing? What are they rejecting? And we're able to optimize the show night after night. That's, I think, when the show really works well, is that we're pulling from the community. I really love the idea of putting things out there and then mining how people are reacting to that thing. It's almost a little bit of an of a science experiment. Just as an audience in a theater lets you know whether something is funny or not, or sad or not, I see right away what the impact of something I've written or an image that I've sent has had. And then I can either develop that and expand it or just let it sit out there. As filmmakers and as storytellers, we have to decide just because they say they want it doesn't mean it's right and it doesn't work. We can't force story, uh, especially when it comes to reality. But that opportunity, um, that opportunity to be here immediately outside of a marketing room where they're turning a dial if they like it or not. Just that opportunity to say, hey, what's engagement? You know, what are people liking, favoriting, retweeting, talking about? I mean, that's, that's the ultimate goal. That's the ultimate goal. I love a little anecdote about Dickens. Many of his novels were actually written as weekly newsletters that as he wrote, he would hear the discourse on the streets, he would go to pubs, he would listen at taverns, he would actually understand that certain characters that he might have otherwise thought as being kind of irrelevant to the central theme of the story were really had great empathy with uh, the audience and so he would build them up. He was essentially collaborating with his audience. So I think that's what it, it kind of means to be live. It's in the moment it's participating in culture. What we're seeing is, whether it's the news, TV, film, politics, or brands, they're all trying to do the same thing, react to the speed and pace and change of culture. It's powerful if you can keep up with that. We have no idea where it's going. We can't control it. We are the first generation to have all these tools. I don't want to sound crazy, but it is a new world in that sense. And we're just starting to realize it. And it's gonna take a generation for 
all of us to really pivot and get and understand truly what that means. Fortune will favor the bold. Fortune will favor the brands, the people, the writers, the directors, the, the craftsmen and women who can obviously embrace this. So when we think about what the future of live storytelling is, the beauty is it's actually shaped by the same principles that shape live storytelling. It's up to you. It's up to how you create, how you react, how you bring the audience inside, and how your opinion shapes the future. I'm really excited about people. People being able to affect brands and affect change because now you know brands can't just go on them on their own. They have to be listening to people. So I'm really excited about people taking that control back. With my show, it is literally about other people's stories and they bring their stories to me. So lots of real people can associate and understand and empathize and engage with it. And I think that's partly what makes Catfish successful and what makes any advertiser or brand that uses live storytelling and engages with the audience that much more likely to succeed. Well, the opportunity to being able to engage the audience in the stories, instead of having a system of just experts and celebrities and politicians making the news, you actually can engage the audience in the news. I think it's an exciting new venture, and I think as we go along, this will be something that will be much more human, much more non-technical, and the great thing about that is relationships will be built. Yeah, I mean, what Twitter has done is just given every single person on the planet a voice, which is just, you know, it's just connected us all, and it's really just changed, changed the world in such a dramatic way, and I, I fucking love it.